Russia has been heavily relying on refurbishing older tanks, such as the T-72, T-62, and T-55-54 models, from its Soviet-era stockpiles. Most of its current tank fleet on the battlefield is relying on tanks no longer in production. While this has allowed Russia to preserve more advanced tanks like the T-90M, Russia's Soviet reserves are depleting quickly, and the tank fleet is on a sharp decline. Since the beginning of the full-scale war, the Russian armed forces have removed almost all of their T-80 tanks from storage, 90%. The Omsk 22nd storage base for T-80 tanks of the Russian armed forces has been completely emptied. Satellite images of the base also confirm this. Also, since February 24, 2024, the Russian armed forces have lost almost a thousand units of this type of tank. Very soon, these tanks will cease to exist in service with the Russian Federation, and this is a very, very good tank. Basically, the tanks remaining in storage in the Russian Federation are T-62, T-64 and T-72 of the most shaggy years. Ascent analyst at HIMARST, who tracks open-air storages and shares insights on X, provides a more detailed assessment. He reported that by July 6, 2024, Russia's stock of T-55s had dropped by 31%, T-62s by 37%, and T-80BS by 79%, with only 9% of T-72s removed from storage. While these figures may not be exact, they provide a good idea about the rapid depletion of Russia's tank reserves. Given that since the beginning of its full-scale invasion of Ukraine, Russia has lost over 3,000 tanks. Information that can be independently confirmed by open-source projects such as Oryx or Warspotting. Russia has lost more tanks than it had in its entire pre-war active duty tank force, as well as and over 30% of its most advanced self-propelled artillery and multiple rocket launcher systems. A report from senior analyst Dara Masakot, published by the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, further details that Russia is expected to exhaust its stockpile of multiple Soviet-era military equipment by 2026. As the initial invasion has evolved into an attritional war, understanding the enemy's will to fight, their resources, and their ability to replace losses becomes critical in order to calculate the trajectory of war. Any attritional war ultimately becomes a test of societal endurance, war economics, diplomacy, and the ability to replace losses. As the war drags on, these problems intensify, pushing one side closer to a tipping point where continuing the war worsens their position. Military production and the capacity to replace losses are among the war's tangible factors that can be calculated and projected well. Kadyrov's troops are leaving checkpoints in the temporarily occupied territory of the Kherson region. They are being completely replaced by Russians. This was reported by Channel 24, citing sources. In addition, it became known that on the left bank of the Kherson region, Kadyrov's men had showdowns with Dagestanis. These conflicts ended in fights. According to the source, one of Kadyrov's men in the temporarily occupied territory reported that their troops were returning home to Chechnya. That is why Russians are now manning the checkpoints. Regarding the conflicts with the Dagestanis, the source noted that this happened in Kalinchak. The reason was obviously the conflict between Ramzan Kadyrov and the senator from Dagestan, billionaire Suleyman Karimov. Recently, Chechen leader Ramzan Kadyrov has accused Russian lawmakers from neighboring regions of attempting to commission his assassination and threaten them with a blood feud unless they prove otherwise. There are witnesses, there are people from whom they tried to commission, whom they asked how much they would take for the order, he said. Kadyrov accused state Duma deputies Bikan Barakoyf and Rizvan Kurbanov, as well as influential billionaire and Federation Council Senator Suleyman Karimov, of plotting to kill him. The three lawmakers are originally from Ingushetia and Dagestan, two Russian republics and neighboring Chechnya. 
If they do not prove otherwise, I will officially declare a blood feud, he was quoted as saying. In Chechnya, blood feuds are a traditional custom of extracting revenge by killing an enemy or his male relatives. Chechnya borders both Dagestan and Ingushetia, and Kadyrov has in the past laid claim to parts of both regions' territory. Two federal lawmakers have denied ordering the assassination of Ramzan Kadyrov after he declared a blood feud against them and a senator amid a dispute over the merger of Russia's largest online retailer Wildberries. Barakoyev denied Kadyrov's accusation that he was involved in an alleged assassination plot. With Allah as a witness, I declare that I knew nothing about this, Barakoyev was quoted as saying by the independent news outlet Fortanga. Multiple felony charges including murder were filed against ethnic Chechens involved in the incident and the ex-husband of Wildberry CEO Tatiana Kim, Vladislav Bakelchuk, who sought Kadyrov's help to block the merger between the e-commerce giant and the smaller outdoor advertising group Russ. A relative of a four-time wounded Russian soldier called the studio of Russian propagandists of Radio Komsomolskaya Pravda and complained that his nephew had not been treated and had been sent to the front lines again. Moreover, he was refused the promised money because he was fighting in the Kursk region. In response, the hosts, who are veterans of the Russian army, began to mock the man and parody his style of speech. Moreover, they sided with the Russian authorities and stated that the Kursk region is not a combat zone and therefore no payments are due to the man's relatives. If your nephew is in the Kursk region, then this is not a combat zone, no payments are due. Why are you really gaping? The propagandist said, a striking illustration of the attitude towards their own military in the Russian Federation, Ukrainian journalist and blogger Denis Kazansky comments on the segments of the broadcast. Plagued by a shortage of personnel due to heavy losses and desertion, the Russian armed forces spare no effort to replenish their ranks. Recently, it became known that conscripts captured during the Ukrainian incursion into the Kursk region and later exchanged faced redeployment to military units on the border. Russian commanders are also in the habit of transitioning wounded soldiers back to active duty as soon as possible, often neglecting their physical treatment and recovery needs, not to mention their psychological trauma. Faced with acute personnel shortages, Russian commanders not only coerce mobilized personnel into signing contracts that cannot be terminated until the end of the war, but also put the wounded back into service regardless of their injuries and degree of recovery. Most servicemen are sent back to the front line as soon as they are released from the hospital. This includes patients with shrapnel in their limbs, post-concussion syndrome, and even without fingers on one of their hands. Not only the wounded, but also HIV, hepatitis C and tuberculosis patients, and even those suspected of suffering from cancer are being sent to the front. 